Stanford University. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for the kind invitation and also for the kind, very kind introduction. And I appreciate everyone coming today to hear me speak a bit about cardiovascular molecular imaging challenges and opportunities. So yes, Joe, I did start in grade school at Wash U, so that's why it was 40, but no, it's only 30 years. But uh, for those of you that haven't had the uh, pleasure of coming to St. Louis, this is the medical center for Washington University. Um, Barnes Hospital here works all the way up to here, Children's. We now have two new hospital towers here. This is uh, about a year out of date. And so the river's over here, the park's over here, and the Danforth campus is over to our west where all the undergraduate and graduate schools are. And so, um, so this is uh, our home, or, or my home is. Um, is my disclosures, nothing today is, I, I think is totally relevant. There are some patents on some of the tracers that I'll be talking about, as well as a research agreement with G, uh, with, M, with Siemens about our MR, but I think and otherwise there shouldn't be much here. So, well, the reason why I chose this topic is because there's been a lot in the literature about cardio cardiovascular molecular imaging, or molecular imaging in general. You guys are clearly one, or if not the leader, one of the leaders in the field. And I want to talk a bit about it because it's one of these areas that we always talk about it as a lot of promise, but not necessarily a lot of delivery yet as it relates to the clinical medicine, even clinical investigation. So how do we get there? So I'm going to address or answer four questions. The first one is, why do we need it? Because as I'll hopefully convince you, I think it's critical for us going forward. My second one will be, what are some of the key developmental and translational challenges that it takes to take such a technology into, into humans. Then how do we overcome these challenges? We'll talk about some strategies and then ultimately can we visualize how this will be used as it relates to drug development as well as for patient management. So let's, first, let's talk about the why because if you don't have a why in life, you don't know what the what's and everything else are really immaterial. This is the um, latest uh, edition from Circulation about the statistics for cardiovascular disease. And I just show this because I think we tend to forget that cardiovascular disease is still the leading killer of Americans. And it's also the leading killer worldwide. And if you look across the different groups, yes, in the less than 85, cancer is higher, but when you take all together, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer. If you look at the diseases that form cardiovascular disease, what are the main drivers of it? Well, coronary heart disease, atherosclerosis, by far the most common, stroke, heart failure, as well as high blood pressure, but really the, in terms of cost and whatnot, the major drivers here are right here, heart, coronary heart disease, stroke, and heart failure. So how do we treat patients in today's world? Uh, my movies aren't working. I have to admit, this is the first place I've ever been where the issue was a PC working with a Mac, not the other way around. But that, that but again, I'm out, in, I'm out in Silicon Valley and whatnot, what can I do? But it's pretty funny, but in any case, these are our typical approaches that we use to study patients. You know, we look at vascular anatomy, whether it be with CTA or, um, or we do intravascular approaches, perfusion imaging with rest stress, you know, SPECT or PET, uh, this should be moving, but it would be an MR imaging showing you flow or even with uh, looking at contrast echocardiography. Echo, again, if it was moving, would be showing you valvular heart disease. We now have elegant measurements of LV function with strain imaging. In this case, the apex is being spared in a patient with cardiac amyloidosis. We have elegant 3D rendering approaches with CT, in this case, a patient with a uh, uh, hematoma around an a, a graft at a coronary anastomosis, as well as elegant functional assessments with MR, again, if we're, if we're moving. We also look at tissue characterization. What I mean by that is what is actually happening in the myocardium. We can look at a flow metabolism mismatch with uh, FDG looking for viability. Late enhancement telling us about fibrosis and using gadolinium. We have newer techniques as well. We have uh, pyrophosphate imaging to look at uh, TTR amyloidosis. We use FDG in, a, in appropriate states to look at inflammation such as sarcoid, as well as T1-weighted imaging to look at extracellular space, uh, looking at things such as fibrosis. We use this technique such as in, in uh, the patients with atherosclerosis, and how do we treat them? Oh, now that one's moving. 
we look at, we use primary and secondary prevention method, methods, you know, statins, aspirin, and so on. We now have the new PCSK9 inhibitors as well. We then, in those patients that have more severe disease, we'll do revascularization with PCI, cabbage. We also have new medical therapies, and particularly those in heart failure, such as the um, ARNIs and, and so on. And then ultimately, those that get more severely diseased, we might put in ICDs, uh, do uh, cardiac resynchronization therapy, LVADs, and um, eventually heart transplant. And we're very good about all this, except that, and if we look, you know, we should pat ourselves on the back. Look at the change in uh, mortality in cardiovascular disease for the three different areas, cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease, stroke, of, from 2005 till 2015, pretty impressive. How, let me do one thing here, one second. Put it over here. But if we look at this, let's think about this. That's now. This is the change in prevalence from 2013 to 2030 in terms of, if we just look at ischemic heart disease, heart failure, and stroke. The, the orange is the, the increases in what we're gonna see. And what, this, what does this mean to us financially? What it means is the following. If we look at this in terms of $2,012, cardiovascular disease would, call, would be 1.2 trillion bucks, would account for 7.5% of our GDP, just cardiovascular disease. If we look at the big three, coronary heart disease, heart failure, and stroke, though we're now talking dollar amounts of the 322 billion, 47 billion, 185, again, 2012 dollars, 43 percent of discretionary spending. This is U.S. discretionary spending. 17 times, just for those three diseases, 17 times the NIH budget, total NIH budget. So this train's coming down the track, so we have to do a better job of treating these patients. Now, intermixed with this challenge is that cardiovascular disease, the pathophysiology of it is, is evolving in front of our eyes. And it's, and it's complex, there are moving targets. For example, most forms of cardiovascular disease are systemic diseases with local effects. Most common when we think about is systemic inflammation leading to coronary artery disease as a local effect. We also have, if you think about systemic insulin resistance, diabetes leading to a heart failure form of diabetic cardiomyopathy or heart failure in general. That synergy happens. So, we, so when you think about looking at the disease to look in one spot, you're missing the full picture. The presentations of heart disease are also evolving. In the 90s, STEMI, ST elevation MI, was the most common presentation of MI. It's now non-ST elevation MI. And that means the pathophysiology is, is also changing. If you look at what a STEMI, what the lesion is for ST elevation MI, it's most likely due to a, a heavily uh, fatty plaque or atheroma that has a thin fibrous cap that ruptures that develops thrombosis. That's different than a non-ST elevation MI that's more plaque erosion, has more, uh, has more protein glycans, has less inflammatory cells, less fat. You still get atherothrombosis, uh, but from different pathology. So what does, and if we look at heart failure, increasing prevalence of heart failure preserved ejection fraction, more common now than heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. We also know the contribution of epigenomic information is changing how we understand disease. Our therapies are, with statins, all of our other therapies are changing the pathophysiology. So what's it mean? It means we need a new diagnostic and therapeutic paradigms because how we thought about disease before is different now the experimental models of disease preclinically may be less relevant. You know, we always think about like an APOE knockout. Well, that model now may not be as relevant to atherosclerosis if we're talking about plaque erosion versus plaque rupture. So what does that mean? It means that we have to actually do the basic fundamental mechanistic studies in humans, not in animal models, to truly understand perhaps how a disease is progressing, how it's evolving, how a therapy is working. The only way we're going to be able to do that is with imaging. So you'll, we'll say, well, precision medicine should help us take care of that. Well, it'll help us, but it's not going to answer all the questions. This is just my summary of, of thinking about it. So you think about it from a 30,000 foot view, what do you have? You've got all this big database of the, of the GWAS epigenetics, the omics data and whatnot. 
you interface that with the patient's own local, if you will, genomics, omics data, so you can interface those uh, and then to link those with the clinical phenotype and environmental factors that ultimately lead you to a precision decision. The bi you'll incorporate that and figure it all out between bioinformatics, between machine learning, AI, and whatnot. That's all great. The problem is, your spike still is not I'm happy with. One more time. See if that works better. Thank you. The problem with this is we're still going to need imaging because, as I mentioned earlier, most cardiovascular diseases are systemic with the local effects. That means, at least in the current state, biomarkers we measure in the blood are not going to tell us what's happening locally, either in the heart or in a blood vessel. And sure, we can get tissue. We've got tissue banks. They're, they're all, all over the place. But if you think about those, they provide very interesting and useful information. But the disease is typically late stage. There are sampling issues. And we don't get it in most patients. And you're not going to do it on a routine basis. So again, we're going to need imaging. The last reason why we're going to need imaging is because of the need in terms of drug development. This slide is taken from a review from Fordyce, and what they show you is the number of compounds in clinical development uh, from essentially in the last 20 some odd years, 15 years, I guess. So what you see is this major growth in the cancer drugs. Cardiac, though, which is yellow, is flat. So what it means is that all the, all the action, if you will, is in, is in uh, neuro-oncology and so on, not in cardiovascular disease. So you could say, oh, gee, then maybe we don't need molecular imaging because there isn't much interest. However, if you look at the temporal trends in the drug development in the cardiovascular space, what you see is that most of the drugs that are going to phase three are new biologic pathways. What that means, it's not repurposing, let's say, a drug we already have for a new indication, like a statin, but actually taking a new entity to develop a new to take it to man for the first time. So that means we've got to be able to target this. And if you look at why these drugs fail, most of them fail because of the efficacy issue, meaning it's not hitting its target or not hitting it appropriately, or their safety issues, meaning that the off-target effects are significant. So again, if we can have imaging that allows us to look at, are we engaging the target? Is it, are we seeing a change in the target and we're not getting other areas? Again, the imaging would be very helpful. So let's think about that from a study that just came out. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have seen the Cantil study. It looked at looking at interleukin-1 uh, beta inhibition in patients post-MI. It was a very large study. They looked at those that tend to have higher inflammation based on CRP and gave multiple levels of the drug to look at cardiac events and found that, in general, there was a benefit, small benefit, giving the drug versus placebo in these patients post ACS, who had ACS syndromes and they followed them longer term. Problem is the following. The relative risk reduction was really small. We're talking pretty small, 0.64%. Uh, the drug costs 200K a year right now. So for a very little gain, you're, not, you're paying a lot of money. And the increased incidence of fatal infection because you're in inhibiting the immune system was, fair, was increased in the treatment group. So it says that if we could have imaging to identify those patients who actually had the increased interleukin-1 beta, perhaps those would be the patients you'd give the drug to, as opposed to others who did not. So that's the why. What about the how and, and the technical challenges? Well, this is just a quick slide that summarizes the relative merits of the various cardiovascular imaging techniques. We have PET, SPEC, bioluminescence, the optical techniques, MRCT. The major points here is that when you look at PET, and I'm, only going to, I'm not going to talk about the optical approaches because I'm going to stay at non-invasive imaging. The benefits of PET and SPEC are two. One, the very high um, sensitivity. We're talking, you know, 10 to the minus 11th, 12, getting almost a picomolar or higher, a nanomolar or higher. Not so great a spatial resolution, but no depth penetration issues. So we can do whole body imaging. We have very high sensitivity, not so great a resolution, but the high sensitivity means I can inject very low mass material. The risk to the patient is very low. I can engage targets that don't have a high expression because I don't have to give a whole bunch of uh, tracer. As opposed to the MRCT ultrasound, which again have much better resolution uh, capability, 
have much better, actually temporal resolution as well, but their sensitivity is less, so to, in order to image, I need to get, with a contrast agent, I now have to give much higher doses, pharmacologic doses of therapy. So the way we get around this is to hybridize these uh, instruments to, again, take advantage of the high sensitivity and the high anatomic capabilities of, um, of the other approaches. And this makes sense also because it looks like we can get much information from multiple parameters. Here's an example of a PET-CT and MR in atherosclerosis in patients with stroke. And what we're looking at is two different parameters. Inflammation measured by FDG, by increased glycolysis, or increased inflammation by an increase in neovascularization measured by the transit rate of contrast through the lesion using MR. Just want to focus your attention down here. These are patients asymptomatic versus symptomatic. The asymptomatic are in the open circles, the symptomatic are in closed circles. And there's a direct relationship, if you will, um, the, the, with the two approaches, but there's a lot of noise between them. And we know that both of these measurements do are associated with symptoms in stroke patients, but the lack of correlation between them suggests that, in fact, they're providing additional information individually and that maybe we should be doing these together to complement them versus doing them separately. The other aspect is the systemic nature of disease. In this study, patients post-ACS were measured with FDG. And so you're going to see this increase in glucose uptake in areas of the uh, vasculature that are still inflamed, as you can see here in the, in the acute coronary syndrome patient versus controls. But the other point is, is that the bone marrow and spleen have high FDG uptake, suggesting that the inflammatory reservoir, if you will, is also increased. So these areas are driving the cells here. So to fully understand what's happening here, you have to understand what's happening here. And in fact, if one looks at that, one sees a correlation between the, F, the bone marrow and splenic up, uptake of FDG with their arterial uptake. So there is a correlation. And in fact, if one looks at the bone marrow FDG and the, and the splenic FDG, those that had high um, or low uptake did much better than those that had high uptake. So again, suggesting that and just that the spleen remains significant, but the point being is that imaging has to detect not just locally, but also systemically. So we now have systems that do that. We have PET-CT, but we also have PET-MR. And the reason why I show the PET-MR is because of its truly multi-parametric uh, capability, so it can not just infarct, edema, or inflammation, but also with a PET, we can look at the um, uh, inflammatory side or in case here with FDG PET as well as get whole body imaging. So the reason why PET MR versus PET CT is because the radiation exposure decrease one gets by doing whole body imaging with MR versus CT, which is going to be much less. Okay, so that's some of the technology, but what about moving things along? And what I'm showing you may have more relevance to PET, but it also has relevance to any type of targeting you want to use to measure a process. And this is really when one thinks about it, one wants to go through these steps of what's the clinical need, all the way through the target ID, probe design, all the way till you get to FDA approval. And the reason why this is relevant is because right now this takes a long time for at least radio tracers. One of the one of the newest tracers as that has been developed is uh, F, you know, the FABC, which is for prostate imaging, and it was first synthesized in 1999. First in man didn't happen until almost 10 years or nine years later, and FDA approval almost 17 years later. We have to find a way to speed this process up, if, and this is true of any type of molecular imaging approach, if it's gonna have usefulness in the clinic and if we're gonna align it with drug discovery and development. So how do we do that? Well, again, two things I think that can help a lot is one, standardizing how we do these three steps, target ID, probe design, and preclinical work, incorporating human tissue, and moving these things as quickly as we can into first in man. So at our place, we've now instituted a, a, a whole program, and it's beyond the scope of today, where our goal is that any new probe, whether it be an MR probe, a PET probe, or what have you, from the time you hypothesize that we want it in man in five years. 
And, how, and so how do we get there? First thing we do in terms of targeting, you know, we always pick out these targets, but if there isn't a clinical importance initially, it doesn't really help a whole heck of a lot to be going after, at least in my mind. There should be documented human expression. One of, you know, and again, so again, that's where the human tissue comes in. It should be accessible to what you're trying, how you're imaging. If, you're, if, you're, if your probe only looks at the endo in the endovascular space and, and you're looking for something inside the tissue, it's not gonna help you very much. My bias is too that the probe or the target should be ubiquitous. What I mean by that is, it's great to have something that looks at one aspect of cardiovascular health, but you want it to be also involved in other diseases, oncology, lung disease, and so on, because ultimately that's going to have relevance and be easier to move into the clinic because there's going to be a lot of push for that. So a fibrotic measurement, for example, fibrosis makes a lot of sense. The design should be simple to do, the binding characteristics well worked out, and the pharmacodynamics, again, you want to be sure you're going to get high contrast and multi-organ imaging capability. So, the, so what about in terms of the probe itself? If you're doing a PET approach, you don't want metabolites because then the image's quality goes down and the ability to quantify becomes problematic. The less reduced mass you can, the higher the specific activity you can have, the better you are because the least amount of mass you give, the better your images are going to be at a, at, a very low, at a lower toxicity. And this is very important also when you have low abundance type tra uh, receptors where you really have to concentrate your tracer or, or whatever it is, MR or PET or whatnot at the site. The toxicity needs to be low, whether it be uh, radiation-based, if it's PET or you know, radionuclide-based, immunogenicity, if you're giving antibody, antibody fragment, or chemical or metal, if you're using an MR approach. And lastly, again, thinking up front, what's your distribution and performance scheme? So for example, if you've got a, a really neat tool that measures something, but it takes you nine hours to do it with a, with a high-performance computer, um, it's going to be hard to do. Whereas if you have something that's easier to do, easier to distribute, more widely distributable, then that's going to be more favorable for more rapid uh, acceptance and more favorable economics. So this is the one where I actually, we've spent the most time, and that's standardizing the preclinical evaluation procedures. What that means is we now have our labs using more general and, and harmonized in vitro assays, use of human tissue to first look for expression of the receptors, for binding assays and whatnot, then testing those probes once they're developed in genetic and pharmacological models to maximize the range of the expression of the target. So then from there, we know we have something that might work, then we take it to limited disease models for benchmarking to see how well it works compared to conventional tracers. I know this looks, sounds really trivial, but I can't tell you how important biostatistical guidance from day one is. And the reason why I bring this up, let me give you a story. We, I had a real pushback when we started to put this in because every investigator wants their own lab, they want to do everything themselves, and they don't want to work with a core. But what you do is when you have the proper biostatistical guidance and you use a core and you standardize these things, you end up doing less experiments, less animals, and get more bang for your buck and you end up having more money in your grant to do other things. So in fact, it is a very cost-effective way of doing it. So, so if you do all these things, you already have predefined performance metrics, and, and use a best practice approach, you can really move things along. Now let me just say on the side here, I don't want to get too far off field because of time, but one of the things that's also coming in the biomedical journal world, you've probably seen it, is this whole concept of not just transparency of data, but also potentially what they call the pre-approval of, of experimental protocols. What that means is that you would submit your protocol as well up front, and then if that's accepted, then your paper has to match that protocol. It can't be, well, we just kind of kept looking and looking, we found something, and here's what we're going to publish. But in fact, you had predefined metrics, your statistics bore that out, and that's what you're publishing. So while I'm not saying this is going to definitely happen, that's what the discussions are right now. So the extent to which you incorporate that now, the extent to which you'll be uh, ready to handle that when it, in fact it does roll out. And then lastly is early first in man use. 
we have so many traces that we think are really better than, than you know, sliced bread, we get them to humans and they just don't work for a variety of reasons. And so we try to get these drugs in the humans as quickly as possible. Most fail, that's okay, but the sooner we get them in, then the sooner that we can figure out the safety bio D, more importantly, the pharmacodynamics and image quality, and from there decide the potential. But if you spend five to seven years doing all these great preclinical studies and think it's great, and you get to humans and it doesn't work, it really has to be iterative. So you go to humans quickly, then maybe you update your tracer, and then you do some more preclinical, you go back to humans and so on. You really want that process to move through quickly and iteratively. So I'm gonna give you one example from our place. So this is uh, targeting the chemokine receptor two. So chemokines, you know, a major component of the immune system, and they're a multi, it's, it's a very large system of these, of these cytokines that in fact work through their various receptors, the chemokine receptors. This one, CCR2, is very important because of MCP1. This is the driver of monocytes, pro-inflammatory monocytes from the bone marrow to parts of the body in response to a um, inflammatory stimuli. And it can, again, work in a variety of diseases, whether it be the heart, the brain, other organs. So we, we wanted to say, could we image this? Because then we can begin to understand really the, uh, how much of the inflammatory signal is due to what's being delivered to the site. So first step was, it expressed, is it expressed in humans? Yes, this is human atheroma. We see that it is in fact expressed. Is it clinically relevant from a drug discovery perspective? It is. This is, a, this is from um, some chemotrex where they have a CCR2 inhibitor that has shown promise in advanced pancreatic cancer. And we're part of those trials. So there's an endpoint here. So this is, okay, these, sorry about the picture. So the, I don't know if his picture is going to be this way. Yang Jin Liu has been the driver of this, the radiochemist. And we worked with our collaborators at INSERM, Christopher Combier, who actually developed a, a peptide, a small peptide antagonist that bound to the first loop of the juxtamembranous juxta position of CCR2 that he identified and verified. And then what Yang Jin did was label it two different ways. Yang Jin took the peptide and essentially using DOTA as a chelator, we able with copper 64. So we had a peptide alone, as well as using a nano cluster, think of it as a small particle, that you could then attach multiple peptides on to have improved targeting and uh, improved signaling. And he worked with Dan Kreisel, a CT surgeon, to look at a uh, model of acute rejection, ischemia reperfusion uh, injury, and lung transplant. So what they did was they took lungs and syngenetic models and they did wild type to wild type, or allogenic models here, wild type to wild type, and you see the massive CCR2 signal here. They then did the same thing, wild type to CCR2 knockouts, you see a reduction in signal. And this is at one hour, this is four hours, and this is out 24 hours. Now it's interesting, this signal that you're seeing in the knockout is from the donor heart. It's not from the you know, it's not in the recipient, it's in the recipient, but it's because of the donor heart. They then found that yes, there was higher uptake in the donor hearts of these animals. Um, and, well, and again, this, this here is from the donor hearts themselves. But if you look at the uh, wild type to wild type, dramatically higher levels of activity. And then what happens is if you then use the nanomaterial, so the same study, but now you're using the nanoparticle, one sees, again, even a higher signal. This is just a nano cluster without the targeting so that we weren't getting nonspecific binding due to the nano cluster itself. But again, showing the ability to improve the signal by using the nano cluster. Now, the other reason for, the, for this is not just to improve the signal, but this nano cluster can be doped with drug. So you now have a platform for theranostics, perhaps a CCR2 inhibitor, take your choice, or some other type of therapy. All right, Yangjin's picture is not going to make it. I'll just have to tell him. Um, he then, the next step was, does the tracer bind to human tissue? And the answer is yes. So these are from, the, from our biobank. This is from carotid endarterectomy, just showing you the histology of the plaque, showing you the CCR2, the uh, CD68 to look for um, macrophages, and you just see the, the co-localization of the two together 
and that there, with autoradiography we see that the tracer is binding. And in fact, it's interesting, the binding fits pretty nicely with what's going on in the H&E. And then here is ischemic cardiomyopathy post MI. Here we're working with Corey Levine, who's a very up and coming uh, immunolo cardiovascular immunologist, just showing that in ischemic cardiomyopathy, there's, there's some expression, we're binding it. But in the early post MI, it's like a few days post MI, I have a patient that died, much higher expression that we were in fact binding to the tracer. Okay, now this slide didn't come out. You'll have to believe me on this. Okay, so what we did was we took an APOE model, and you can see a little bit of it, but they looked at the expression of CCR2 early at four weeks post-diet, eight weeks, 12 weeks, and saw progressive increases in CCR2 expression that were matched by increasing signal intensity over that time, suggesting that we are seeing the very early stages of atherosclerosis or can detect it with this model. The next step was to then say, okay, can we, can we pick out regression? And so again, these slides aren't working, I apologize. So Dan has a very nice model of what he does is he takes the aortic arch from an APOE mouse that's been fed a high fat diet for two months and transplants it up into the carotid area of a, of a wild type. And then he can look at the regression of the atherosclerosis over time. And what you're seeing here is, on, is over here now that the, beta, you know, the APOE, you can see your plaque, and this is what it looks like over time, how you see regression of that plaque. And here's just the expression of CCR2. This is early in the APOE versus a sham. But here's what you have here is this is, this is the contralateral side. But here's or the, the sham operation. But here you can see the APOE initially and after the transplant, the decrease in signal. So we have a tool for possible um, following of therapy. Well, what about, what about post-MI? Same thing. In this case, a little different. Because we want to broaden the potential distribution, we also are looking at this tracer with gallium-68. So in this model of ischemia reperfusion, I think it was a 15-minute, uh, in a mouse, 15-minute ischemia with one day of reperfusion, what one sees is no big surprise in the post-inflammatory stage, post-MI, one sees this massive influx of CCR2 positive monocytes that eventually transition to CCR2 positive macrophages. If you look at the imaging, and this is uh, at four days, this is the FDG image, you see the hole, that's where you'd see expect for an infarct, but this is the gallium CCR2 showing you the inflammatory component in the same site. And then here, what you're looking at is just the percent injected dose, the quantitative measurements early on for the MI in black, the sham in white. This is a CCR2 knockout. This is naive, and you can see the dramatic increases in the CCR2 uptake early in the infarction phase. It drops over time, which is well known. We know we have this essentially a phase that looks like this with inflammatory monocytes that are then paralleled by an increase in monocytes that are reparative. So if you think about, and again, this just shows a progression of the MI, but think about how a tracer like this could help us with therapies that target this time to decrease the pro-inflammatory phase. So we've taken this to humans. This was done on March 6th. This is just our first normal, just showing you that um, the two points. One, the imaging looks uh, of high quality in terms of no, very little background, because if this was very high background, it would mean we'd have difficulty, but in fact, other than the liver, the kidney, the liver, the kidneys, and um, we have pretty good low background, so that means we should be able to image most organs, although clearly aorta in here may be problematic. So let me finish up with um, talking about drug trials and how cardiovascular imaging can help us. This ties back to what I showed you earlier in that these are the number, when I went out to clinicaltrials.gov about a year, uh, nine months ago, these are the number of trials using PET, just PET. We had roughly 1,000 using either FDG or other for oncology. Cardiovascular disease, about 100. So it fits with like what I showed you before that most of the action has been in the oncologic space and the cardiovascular disease, not as much. But how can we use it? Well, here's one example, again, of knowing your target. This is the 
Dow Outcome Study, which looked at if I raised HDL in patients with coronary artery disease, could I decrease outcomes? And what they found with their drug was no big surprise, their drug increased HDL significantly. It had no effect on LDL, but HDL went up dramatically. Arterial inflammation measured by PET, although this went down, this was not significant. So while HDL went up, arterial inflammation didn't go down. So what then happened with outcomes? There are no differences in cardiovascular events. So it gets back again. Okay, I have a blood biomarker that says I did what I'm supposed to do, but I didn't target the tissue to say, did I get the response I wanted to get? And so if we can image here to help us to say, yes, this is working here, we probably should be getting better results there. So from the, this is from the oncologic world, just to give you one example of this. It's a study now, it's over 10 years old, but showed very nicely. This is in patients with advanced head and neck cancer, and they were randomized to radiation therapy plus cisplatinum and 5-FU, or cisplatinum plus terparazine, tri Parazamine, I don't live in this space, so uh, I don't know how the drug works. But what they also did was they imaged these patients with fluoromycinidazole PET. Fluoromycinidazole is a hypoxic agent. As the tissue oxygenation goes down, this tracer is trapped within tissue. Uh, there would have been images here, but it's not working. But the point, oh, this slide didn't work either. Unbelievable. Okay. So what did they find? What they found was that if you took all patients, all comers, and looked at the local recurrence, there is no difference between the, two, between the two, two approaches. However, if you then stratified the patients based on those that had high fluoromycinidazole and those that had, meaning high levels of hypoxia versus those that had low levels of hypoxia because they had a low level of fluoromycinidazole, what they found was the, cis, the, cisplat, the cisplatinum to parazamine cohort now had no, only one of eight had local recurrence, whereas those with a hypo who didn't have hypoxia did not, they had more local recurrence. So what it showed you was that in fact you could use this to help you guide who should in fact get the drug and who shouldn't. It can also help us potentially with picking doses. This approach, again, in cancer, uses looking at the estrogen receptor. The estrogen, uh, this work was actually, the, the tracer itself was developed at WashU by the late Mike Welch. But what the tracer tells you is not the presence of the receptor, but the function of the receptor, which is more important than just its presence. And so it's, so it's a biomarker, again, of both the occupancy and, and also it's, whether it's downregulated. So what they were able to do was use that and say, did the drug decrease the tracer uptake, and at what dose was the tracer uptake decreased consistently and adequately in patients with breast cancer to help drive the use of this ER antagonist into the next phase. And what they found was using this waterfall plot was that when they got this 300 milligram dose, they said, you know what, most of these patients are all here, we should go with that dose. So they could use this approach, the imaging, to look at the number of patients who responded to a key endpoint to tell them that's the dose I'm going to use in the next study. So my last uh, slide in this space, though, is using it to guide phase three trial design. One of the neat agents we now have is technetium pyrophosphate. This drug goes back to the 1970s for MI imaging. It was recently found, probably in the last few years, that in fact this drug binds in amyloidosis that is due to transthyrethin amyloidosis as opposed to the AL types of amyloidosis. And it's quite good, in fact. It has a sensitivity of over 99%, very high specificity for TTR, almost 100%. And it's now being used in many centers, ourselves included, to guide those patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction who has amyloid, who doesn't. What's well, actually now been used to, because there are new therapies coming online, such as uh, talfamidus, which has been used for neuroamyloid, focal neuroamyloid, because it, it stabilizes a normal transthyrethin protein. But they wanted to use it in a heart failure study. So what they did, an amyloid heart failure, so what they did was identify those patients who had amyloid based on a variety of parameters, but they also had to have a positive pyrophosphate scan. And if they did, they entered the trial. If they didn't, they didn't get in. So they're only looking for patients who had the disease. So again, using a good bio, a biomarker to drive enrollment. And what they found 
was that this, they just republished this back at the end of March. It said the drug met its primary endpoint of that of, of decreasing uh, all-cause mortality and cardiac-related uh, hospitalizations with minimal or no safety issues. Yep. Uh, so what that says is that, again, an example of where we could use molecular imaging in drug discovery and development at a very late stage. Okay. But even, again, the next, the last point I want to make, though, I went through that whole pathway. But even at the end of the day, we've got all this work to do that we haven't even gotten to because we haven't done the clinical trials. We've got to be able to characterize and improve the repeatability and reproducibility of the measurements. We all publish trials where we say, oh, gee, look at this, it looks great, we can separate out patients. But if you can't do it reproducibly and be able to develop sample sizes and so on, we are going to have difficulty doing longer term trials or bigger trials uh, for either clinical evaluation or drug therapy. I think we're going to learn from our oncology um, colleagues. They've done a lot of this, whether it be the NCI, Core Labs in, in terms of Akron, as well as the RSNA um, QIBA initiative. We can begin to link these biomarkers to bioinformatics so we can better understand the individual phenotype or the individual patient phenotype in these big databases, whether it be the MESA trial, which is trying to do this, as well as the NCI and CTN study. And ultimately, we can be, I think we can begin to learn now from trials. I just showed you the pyrophosphate trial with amyloidosis. There are others in sarcoid with FDG. We need to be able to learn from those to drive and develop the next set of trials as we develop these new agents. So let's go through the questions from the beginning. Why will why, will, um, why is it important for cardiovascular molecular imaging? To, because it's going to play a fundamental role and I think transform cardiovascular care. You, precision, medicine, precision medicine, I don't see happening without it. It'll be used for clinical investigation because of the issues I mentioned about the changing pathophysiology. And it's going to be a, play a major role in cardiovascular therapeutic discovery and design. What about, the, what do we need? Well, the tools are going to have to be multimodality. I already said, one size does not fit all. We have to take advantage of the strengths of each one. And we're going to have to think whole body versus local effects. Sure, there are a whole bunch of challenges, but I think, you know, I think there are paths forward to do this. The major one is not just the quality of the research, but the speed of it. We've got to pick up the speed to be able to align ourselves both with the cardiovascular space, which is changing rapidly, and the therapeutic discovery space, which is changing even more rapidly. How do we do this? Again, taking a best practice approach to how we handle the science. We incorporate human evaluation very early on. And I think we have to learn from our, our peers, in this case our peers in oncology, neurology, and so on that are ahead of us because they have both the tools and more importantly the drugs to do this. So how do we incorporate into a future patient paradigm? Let me give you one example of what I think could happen. And so this is 12 years in the future. You remember what I showed you before, that linear path of how we treat patients. Well, this is may perhaps what will happen instead. We will use a, you know, our big data approach to identify a high-risk patient, but we don't know where the disease is. Where is the, you know, is it an area that needs to be a stinted or not? So we will identify that lesion through molecular imaging. We're also going to, want to know systemically what's going on. Does that mean that what's happening here is at the end of its phase, or is there still a whole bunch more inflammation that's going to be coming online, which will change our therapy? This will lead to intensive therapies that include anti-inflammatories such as, I already talked about, like IL-1 beta inhibitors, other forms of immunosuppression, gene products, and so on. Simultaneously, we will be using, giving adjuvant therapies such as aspirin, various platelet inhibitors, you know, ACE inhibitors, and so on, as well as other novel inhibitors. And then we'll look, continue to follow our biomarkers. If our biomarkers don't show improvement, we're going to go back around. If they do show improvement, we now have a stable patient. And then maybe as we screen to see how they're doing, if they stay stable, fine, we stay over here. If they don't stay fine, we go back through this. So it's much more, if you think about it, it's almost like an oncologic approach to treatment of cardiovascular disease. So I think my other slides are totally off, so I'm going to stop there, and I'll take any questions. Thank you. the first question about the
pyrophosphate, mm -hmm. what is the variability of that imaging? Is it plus or minus 5%, 7%? And then the treatment with the drug, uh, <clears throat> is that you're expecting after the patient gets treated with the drug? Uh, what it get? What, you know, what basically the delta would be much bigger than the variability of the imaging? How, did, how are the clinicians using this particular scan? Well, this, this is, yeah, this is a, a very simple scan to do. We image for an hour. We measure the uptake rel and measure it relative to no uptake, less than bone, equal to bone, greater than bone. And then we also look at the heart versus the lung on the opposite side. If it's equal to or greater than bone or the heart to lung ratio on the opposite side is greater than 1.6, it's amyloid. So you're normalizing into the bone. What? So the patient has maybe osteoporosis or bone yeah, disease. Yeah, that. those are all good questions. We don't know those answers yet. Nor we, what we also don't know is as you treat amyloid, does this go down? We don't know that. Stanford University.